Well, the only reason why there has to be intersectionality and why we have to address it in that way is because things got separated and dismantled in the first place. Male, female, black, white, tall, short, good, evil. Mm. Like it got mm-hmm. separated already. Gay, straight, all of that happened when, again, in, in indigenous cultures and more ancient, it's like, oh, you, all of those things? Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 94. Singing High, Singing Us with Patrick Daly. This was an episode inspired by my scholarly article habit, which comes into my email every so often, anytime that academia.edu comes out with something about choir or voice, and I don't remember what other keywords that I put in there, but I get these, these articles in my email, and I saw one that was called Singing High, Black Countertenors and Gendered Sound in Gospel Performance. And this article is fascinating about what he has been through in his life and his work to become a countertenor and a countertenor with a stellar career. The article dropped into my email box, uh, as I said, and I immediately thought, this is a podcast. We have to do this. And I ended up being right. This is a great episode. You're going to want to stick around for Patrick's story is not only fascinating, but his experience is emblematic of the intersectional concept, the concept of intersectionality. He is a living uh, example of that. In that, Patrick's race and his sexuality impact the way audiences receive him. The perceptions constantly swaying between singing high like a woman, in air quotes, to presenting as the good Baptist man. You will also appreciate the in-depth discussion of the history of the black church, the music of the black church in America. So join me and stick around for this enlightening conversation as Patrick shares his story. Don't forget, you can support this show in the most meaningful way possible, which is Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy is a way that you can sign up to to chip in at least $3 a month, which is like buying me a coffee a month, because you appreciate the content and you appreciate the work that it does to go into this show. And right now the Patreon subscribers are underwriting the recurring monthly costs that it takes to put on this show, like advertising, uh, web hosting recently, Tracking data uh, has become, for podcasters, more expensive than it was before. Uh, So there's all these types of things that continue to mount for me to keep the show going, and the Patreon folks are the MVPs of that. One of the levels of the Patreon sponsorship is called the producer level. The producers at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Vasquez Academy of Music, John Warner, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcón, Angie Schilling, Chandler Smith, David Kowalsik, Kyle Peterson, Jeff Wall, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. Okay, everybody, I am here with Patrick Daly, and I'm really excited to talk to Patrick. I, I'm going to tell a little story, Patrick, here as to why you're here. I subscribe because I'm a nerd. I subscribe to academia.edu's mailing list where anything about voice or anything about choir, it, it, if anybody's writing an academic paper, I get this email, right? And I get this email that pops up, and it's called uh, Singing High, Black Countertenors and Gendered Sound in Gospel Performance. And I click on it, and it's about Patrick Daly. And I was like, I met Patrick Daly through Brandon Boyd, a mutual friend. And I was like, okay, this, is, this has got to be interesting. So I read the paper, and I was fascinated. And here you are, Patrick, so welcome. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm glad to be here. This is going to be fun. Alicia Jones wrote this paper. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, how this paper came to be, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can see it. It's also available on Oxford Handbook of Voice Studies. Uh, So what, how do you get to be in an academic paper and be the star of it? (laughs) Uh, Good question. Um, So Dr. Jones and I have sort of known each other um, through various circles, uh, I mean, for, for a good number of years now. Um, when I was in undergrad at uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore, um, she was, she's, fr- she's a native uh, of Washington, D.C., a native Was- Washingtonian, as they like to call it. So she was sort of around that area between 
you know, the Baltimore, DC, the whole DMV area. So we were very familiar with each other in those scenes. Um, also very familiar with her work uh, sort of in the black church as a seminarian, as a musician as well. So she's becoming knowing, starting to know me in those same kind of spaces. And I'm trying to remember even how we officially connected, but I want to say that she probably reached out to me via Facebook and said, hey, I just want to pick your brain or ask you about your experiences uh, as a countertenor. And in those experiences, it also led me to presenting at the um, Center for Black Music Research's first Black Vocality Symposium. Uh, held at the, and of course, the Center of Black Black Music Research is housed or had been housed at uh, Columbia College of Chicago. Okay. So I presented there in 2013, and I think my topic was, yeah, the anatomy of the Black voice, challenges, peculiarities, and regional differences. Uh, so that kind of started me on my way, and she and I have been consistent collaborators in various places and various points, including this article, conferences, et cetera. Well, that's, well, that's awesome. So, um, but you, you mentioned, I have a, I'm going to go a slightly different direction here because you mentioned something that uh, made me curious. So when you say the anatomy of the black voice, is that kind of a euphemism or do you mean like the, like the physical anatomy? Yeah, more of a euphemism. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Nothing's really any different. <laughs> I, w I was going to say, because I've actually had somebody make that argument to me before, and it was really weird, um, that there is like a different anatomy with the Black singing voice physically. Uh, you know, as I kind of say in lectures, is internally, there's really nothing too different, right? Now, there are some external factors, um, you know, the width of the nose, uh, lips, mm -hmm. uh, how mm -hmm. one, like if like folks can't see me, but uh, I, I'm from the South and I speak very wide, I can. Um, also Northern folks do the same thing. Hey, yo, what's good, son? Like all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So having those aspects, uh, you know, and sort of like your regionalisms, your sort of uh, phenotypic makeup, those things do affect singing. Uh, but in terms of like the vocal folds themselves, the larynx, you know, our, our, our support mechanism, the body, that's ne nothing's really any different. But it also, but also to that end, it's sort of as was coined, and I cannot remember who said it, but as I always like to say in the lecture, it's more so than the anatomy of our experiences. There you go. Yeah. That we're speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's really easy to keep those lines blurry between what is essentially culture and what is, what is what we call race. Right. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of blur there, um, which I, I think really sets us up nicely for the conversation that we're going to have. Uh, before I, we do that, though, uh, tell us a little bit more about you. So uh, as, as we set your scene here, where do you come from? Uh, originally, where, do you, where did you kind of cut your teeth as a musician, etc.? Don't forget, the Coralosophy promo code is your ticket to discounts all across the web for fantastic coral products from great companies, mom and pop organizations even, of coral people who are feeding us, uh, as p teachers in the classroom, a ton of great products and services. So let me do give you the quick reminder rundown. So there's Sight Reading Factory, of course. They were our first sponsor to come on, along with Ryan Main, uh, way back when the, the show started three years ago. So sightreadingfactory.com is of course your your membership yearly and every time you turn in that membership you can use Coralosophy again at checkout and get a discount every single year for you and your students with ryan main's website you can enter in that checkout and code you get 10 percent off you also own the pdf forever which means you can print as many copies as you need to into the future so that's exciting graphite publishing is also a sheet music website that allows you to search for difficulty level, accompaniment instruments, uh, voicing, all kinds of things. And they are, it is also a PDF download and print kind of a format. They've got fantastic composers like Jocelyn Hagen, Tim Takash, Eric Barnum, a great company over there as well. And finally, mymusicfolders.com. That is a place you can get the top of the line singers masks. And yes, the top of the line 
scienced the crap out of these masks. They are the best ones you can buy. You can uh, also get fantastic top of the line choir folders as well as a ton of other choir gear. And mychoirrobes.com is their, their website as well. All of those will take the Coralosophy checkout code for discounts. And when you do that, it helps me a lot. So check out those companies and let them know that you're listening. Yeah. So I, anytime I'm speaking anywhere, I always like to start like this. Uh, I am the great grandson of West Tennessee sharecroppers, Mar Pearl and Daddy Fred Slocum, uh, on my mother's side. Uh, my mother uh, is, is, of course, their granddaughter, and she was raised on their farm. Uh, I'm Freddie Mae Levy's grandson. Uh, I should also go back and say that my great grandmother, Ma Pearl, lived to be 102. Mm. Uh, my grandmother is 94 and still living, but still with us. She was what you would call sort of in the golden age of gospel. And even prior to that, what we would call the high note soprano. <laughs> so in any other groups that would have, you have somebody that kind of hits the, ah! nope, that's her. Uh, and still got it, to be very clear. Uh, my mother came to Nashville in 1966 to attend then Tennessee a and I, Agriculture and Industrial State University. Um, it's now Tennessee State University. She stayed in Nashville. Uh, she met my father, of course, at Tennessee State. Um, and raised me here in Nashville. Uh, my home, uh, in my home church, which is right across the street uh, from Tennessee State, Friendship Missionary Baptist Church Incorporated. And that's where I began singing. Mm. Uh, in that church and in the home of my nanny, Mother Martha Long, uh, and her husband, Deacon Ben Long, and my godmother, Linda Long. So I sang in those spaces. And at three years old, um, went to National School of the Arts and came up through National Public Schools and the music programs there. And it was interesting because at the time, there was a lot of shifting in regards to music education in the city. And so programs were not, you know, ubiquitous in Music City, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so that's a problem. Uh, but we made it through and I did attend the National School of the Arts. And I started studying voice and having interest in voice because of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Ah, yes. I okay. wanted to go to Fisk and be a Jubilee Singer. And um, I was obsessed with that. <laughs> and then eventually... I started getting interested, not just in the Jubilee Singers, but in other black college choir traditions and programs and vocal programs. And that's when I discovered eventually Morgan State University, seeing them on PBS. Um, and then they came to town. And of course on the PBS special, there's a countertenor, Ernest Saunders, or Sir Sanders rather, and uh, he sings Dr. Nathan Carter's arrangement, if I can help somebody. So I was like blown away. Then Morgan comes to town and in that same concert, that concert that they came to town in rather, there are three countertenors. And I was like, whoa. So as I'm sitting there saying, okay, I hear myself for the first time. I see myself for the first time. And these singers, not just the countertenors, but the entire pro core program and and vocal is, I was just like so blown away by. My mother is saying, uh, you know, there's a man that, well, let me back up a little bit. There's a gentleman that comes out in the middle of the program and talks about what they do at a program called Salama Urban Ministries and Performing Arts Institute and how they build young people and how they prepared young people to go out into the field and whatever they want to do. And so as I'm saying, Oh God, I hear myself, I see myself. I think this could be the place for me. My mother prays and says, I pray my son gets to work with that man. Well, push come to shove. I was actually invited to, while in high school, to audition for a play, uh, The Gospel at Colonus at Fisk. And lo and behold, when I go into the rehearsal, into the audition, there is that man, William Krim who became my uh, voice teacher. 
and he transitioned me from tenor to counter tenor and sent me to Morgan. And that's pretty much it. Wow. Well, that's great. And, and so uh, I, that was, I'm glad you filled that last detail in because that was going to be my next question is how, how the switch to counter tenor uh, actually came about. Uh, I've, I don't know if you know this about me, but I've, I do some counter tenor myself, but I'm not fancy like you. Um, I, I do it when the choir needs an alto and there isn't one. Like that, that's, that's when I do it. Um, but, uh, so nothing like soloist or anything like that, like that. But, uh, so, okay. So I'm, what I'm really interested in is I've read through this paper and I, I'm interested in your experiences and it sounds like the same, uh, things that Dr. Jones was interested in, in this paper, which is essentially reads like almost like a third person narrative of your life, uh, mm-hmm. of your, of your experiences. And everybody should definitely read it, but I'm going to pick out a spot here that I was in, uh, particularly interested in where it says that your strategies revealed that historically black Protestant audiences' receptiveness to countertenors' vocal performance is closely to linked to the way their sound is embodied. So in other words, the way you present yourself in the church physically, the way you speak, um, all of those types of things affects the way they hear you when you sing. Um, talk about that. What's, what's that like and what does that mean? Yeah, I... I would also say too, when Dr. Jones and I were first doing this particular work and this particular article comes up, you know, I think I might've been 21, 22. Um, Maybe I just finished grad school at Boston University. Um, I do, I vividly remember the conversation. So it's a, so this is very different (laughs) from how I kind of see things and how I maneuver now. Oh, great. But I will say, I did feel at that time, in order for me to be accepted and for my sound to be accepted, I sort of had to perform, for lack of a better word, I kind of had to perform a certain, a certain amount of masculinity, mm-hmm. um, whether that was real or not. I had to sort of come in present in the manner in which I'll say like this, I had to perform in a way that was disarming and present in a way that was disarming so that when I open up, the shock will be lessened and they can kind of focus in more on the message and on the gifting and the work. Now, what do you think caused that to be the situation? Like, what are your theories about what leads to that? Uh, That's a good question. I think having a, growing up with, and I I want to be clear too, because I was raised in a household, I was raised by by an educator and by people who really were very loving and in many ways very affirming. Um, I did not sort of present or, speak about my sexuality in particular until like much later, you know, like that gets to college. Um, But I was still allowed to kind of have my childhood as my mother always says, you're gonna have your childhood in whatever way that looks like. But I do, I did understand from a very early age, this idea of respectability. Hmm. Um, And so most people talk about respectability in terms of how, of how a person of, of African descent in particular, or another person of color may present, you know, sort of defaulting to something that would be quote unquote professional, using a, uh, a voice that is very clear. So not really using, you know, slang or lax language and accent, uh, you know, dressing, sort of buttoned up and again, professional, how we tend to understand that in this society. So that was my mentality in regards to what it was for, for, for race. And I also understood too, that certain churches that I would go into were places of respectability. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I saw, and I know, and I see what people are wearing on Sunday morning. You know, you're in a suit, you are in a, in a fine pantsuit or the dress or the, or, or, you know, 
the hats and all of those sort of things and and, and, and very mannerable, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so by extension, I wanted to make sure that I was presenting something that was not going to alarm folks in regards to not, it, it, and, and this isn't an issue of race, particularly in like the black church, but, it, but in regards to sexuality. Right. That some would deem, oh, well, you're that. So all of a sudden, you can't really focus on the quote unquote ministry aspect, but you're wondering who I am when I leave this sanctuary and what I do when I leave this sanctuary. And I wanted to make the, the moment about the quote unquote ministry. Oh, yeah. Now that's a really well uh, put explanation. I, what I'm curious about too, is I wonder if, do you ever think, or uh, is it possible that in some of the churches and in some of these situations where you were made to feel this way, intentionally or not, probably not, uh, that there's just a, a, a lack of exposure to people who present to the world the way you do and sing the way that you do. And, and some people would just... Because uh, the reason I'm asking that is like, I can totally picture, um, you know, you, I'm a white guy. I went to white guy church when I was growing up, but I can picture that if I got up or, or, well, I'm also straight, so I'm losing all the points here. But if an effeminate presenting gay man countertenor were to have sung in my white church growing up, it would have been weird for people too, mm -hmm. you know, and, and because very conservative kind of um, type, uh, especially around sexuality. I would say the, the the people I grew up around were way more skittish about sexuality things than they ever would have been about race. Like if a black person came into our church, we would have been overjoyed. But if a gay person came into our church, that would have been different. Um, and so I wonder if there, if there's any of that part of it too, or it's just this lack of exposure, lack of, lack of knowing the culture, uh, that you were bringing into the room. That's very interesting. Um, I think that that element definitely can be in some sacred black spaces, right? Mm -hmm. At the same token, again, most of the places where I would be singing are very professional and educated spaces. Mm -hmm. so, you know, as I said, I grew up in a church and I'm still a member of a church that is in directly in front of, of, a, of an, an entire university. Right. Where most of the members went to that same university. So, you know, the, 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 the membership is educated and exposed, uh, but there's still that element of respectability. It's also, you know, this idea that we think of the South as not as, um, as, not as progressive in some things. Mm -hmm. And the other side that we kind of look at is this, um, you know, baby, it is what it is, you know, because we, oh, I'll say it like this. There has always been this idea, or we've, we've known that there are same gender loving, gender non conforming, trans, um, queer folks in our churches. We just don't talk about it. Ah. And I think part of why yeah. there's a not talking about it is not, it's, <clears throat> how can I put this? There are some who would argue, and it's a good argument, that they don't want to see those people who are other. But we also have to look at the roots of why folks would not want to see and embrace the other. Yeah. Because to be very clear, uh, that is not necessarily, that is not necessarily an, as, an, an attribute that is foundational in ancient and indigenous communities. It is an attribute that is very much from, from the West, from colonialism. So then all of this heteronormativity, the, um, the, the binaries, the patriarchy, you keep on naming it, 
often come from outside influence. And because we are situated in a social structure that we really have no power and control over, we maneuver the best we can in that social structure. Sometimes it's successful and it's very open and loving and accepting. And sometimes it's not those things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of, from an early-ish place, I kind of always wanted to ensure that there was um, grace for those situations. And so my coming in and presenting in a disarming way, but never lying. You know, I never said I wasn't this. Right. You know, I can present or I will present masculine because that's me too. And if I present a little more feminine or softer, that's also me too. None of it, uh, it they're, they're, not, they're not exclusive. Right. So I would do that just to ensure that firstly, again, the quote unquote ministry moment is at the forefront. And two, that if I can kind of break a little bit in there, maybe I'll make it better for someone else. And I'll stay in some form in community with that community to ensure that they get the exposure and the information necessary. That's great. And it, I like what you said about the, you know, reminding, being reminded to offer grace in those situations because people don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And if, and if they don't know how to operate within that, like you said, a, a social, um, uh, social structure, I guess, yeah, a structure or even like, I, I like to think of it like, uh, bound, boundaries on a football field. Like you've, you've been, there's, there are certain things like you don't know that there's, that you can just step across the line and keep walking. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so pe when people don't know that, then, then you're, you're able to then give them that benefit of the doubt that they don't hate you. They don't, um, judge you necessarily. They just don't know how to interact in that way. Um, and, and that's something that you learn and you gradually, you know, I, I, I feel like that I'm trying to put myself back in my childhood church because like, I, I can totally, I, I stopped going to the church that I grew up in when I was about, I don't know, 17, 16, something like that. But because that was, that was an extremely uh, small football field. Like we, there were only certain number of things that we were allowed to think and allowed to do um, and especially allowed to experience in the world. And I can just totally picture that in my own um, I guess in my own story. Um, okay. So I've got another spot in the paper, if that's okay to look, to, to kind of read out and ask your opinion about. So, um, there's another, a few paragraphs down, and this was fascinating to me, uh, where sometimes you'll go to this, this church and then Dr. Jones puts this quote in there, uh, which is that sometimes you would get the question, can you sing us? African-American novices to Western art music often ask this uh, of formerly trained black singers who sing in gospel settings da uh, daily, that's you, shared that this type of query was put to him, and I was also asked a similar question by, by kids uh, before. So the idea of, can you sing us? You're a classically trained singer, you, you've, you're a countertenor, um, and then sometimes you're asked that question, what does that mean to you, and how would you explain, can you sing us to us? Yeah. Oh, man, I forgot about that. Can you sing us? So, hmm, got to think about it for a second. Let's back up a little bit. Absolutely. Um, because a lot of my work, uh, because of Dr. Jones, has really gone deep down into studying and preserving understanding the larger swath, the larger experience of Black sacred music within the, you know, particularly Black Christian church as we know it. So you have what are called the quote unquote high churches. Um, that could be churches like Abyssinian in New York, Abyssinian Baptist, um, Ebenezer Baptist Church, the King Family Church. Uh, Third Baptist of San Francisco. These are churches that 
regularly sing anthems. They produce and have produced, you know, Handel's Messiah, Mendelssohn's Elijah. Mm-hmm. These have been the churches that have hosted our historic black colleges and universities, choirs and on tours, et cetera. Um, these are places of honor for the sort of, I guess you could say for lack of a better term, black elite to be okay. yeah. situated. Mm-hmm. And then you have, of course, what they call the low churches. Um, and that would be closer to things maybe in the country, maybe in the city. Those also tend to be associated with the more charismatic uh, denominations, Church of God in Christ, um, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, uh, the Apostolic Church, the Holiness Churches, etc. cetera. Um, and so, and then, you know, and then they all kind of gloss together. <laughs> So it does. So just because there's a high church doesn't mean that they may not sing some of those same Pentecostal leaning um, songs. Now, so when the, you uh, help help me with a term real quick, when when you say charismatic churches, I think I know what that means because I I think I, I've been to one recently. But will you explain uh, what that means? So these are churches. These are churches that come out of and are usually associated with uh, the Azusa movement that happened in the West Coast. Um, And these are places in which um, the expression of what we call dancing, praise dance, and not necessarily a choreographed thing, but that the spirit hits you, rather, as we say, the spirit hits you and then your feet get light and you start moving and, and, and it's, and it's to a rhythm or you may start running. Mm-hmm. Um, the gift of tongues is encouraged or, or speaking in tongues is encouraged. Um, so these are those kinds of spaces. And in many ways, I love those spaces. I love the black church in general, but I love those spaces too, because whether they realize it or not, it's a very African practice. This idea of, it, but on those churches, there would be a practice called um, uh, tarrying. So that you tarry, you wait, and you, you wait for, and invoke and, and pray for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to come down uh, and give you a gift and visit. There will be a visitation of the Spirit and that can manifest in maybe the gift of tongues. Uh-huh. They manifest in a gift of prophecy. It, may, it manifests in some way. And this idea of tarrying is, some could argue, is very akin to conjuring. Because hmm. what you see people doing is they're kind of clapping and they're speaking and intoning over and over again and repeating until it hits you. So that's more of a practice that would happen in those charismatic spaces. It's not that it's it's not that it's like devoid of existing in like the Baptist Church, um, the the African Methodist Episcopal Church, et cetera, uh, because you know different culture, different regions, those, those things. But those things happen more so in those kinds of churches. So when brought with the question, "Can you sing us?" You're going into spaces that may or may not have exposure to these various experiences in singing, in worship, in sacred music, et cetera. So they read your bio, they hear about you, and they hear you sing the first song. And they're like, well, that was really nice. You know, they're impressed. Uh You know, they make, oh, that was lovely, beautiful. You know, uh, I always, I know, there's always a saying, we know that you're singing well when you're going to certain types of churches and somebody yells out, beautiful, <laughs> because they just like, oh, they have beautiful tones. And so they just yell it out because people are really sitting there listening because they don't always hear that. So they're asking, can you sing us? Like, can you get down with our other styles? Like, can you sing the stuff that we hear? What well, I would say on the radio. <laughs> um, because, but gospel music has changed in the last few years too. But um, 
but you know, the things that kind of rock, quote unquote, rock the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the things that we're comfortable with that we already know. And so I usually can respond, yes, I can. I can squall with y'all. <laughs> I, I will spin the tone. I will holler in this full chest voice all the way up and I will squall and I'll still spin again. So it's all there. That's great. Now, do you, do you sometimes, like, I, I mean, have you ever gone into a, a, like a church to perform or to sing or to lead, lead songs where you intentionally, you know, that that kind of request is going to be out there anyway. So you plan for something classical with something not? You know what? So you're going to make me give away my secrets. Um, <laughs> but a little bit, yes. Yeah. I always do. I, again, as I said, a lot of my, especially now, my singing, my development, what I do in community, how I work with my students, um, so many things. I'm really looking at, in, and, 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 and to be clear, in addition to singing opera, to singing early music, to singing studio sessions, to new music, all of that, core music, whatever. I love, you know, exploring these full expressions of sacred music in the Black church. So I tend to sing things that are quote unquote old school. Um, I'll lean towards singing in a style that is more closely reminiscent of like the Barrett sisters out of Chicago, Um, the Roberta Martin singers, um, Wings Over Jordan, sort of this uh, Mahalia Jackson, um, goodness gracious, all of those kind of folks. Uh, Oh, Robert, uh, yeah. I'm got to say his name wrong. So yeah, anyway, but I sing like. <laughs> no worries. I'm about to sing as well. I'll say I don't want to mess up the ancestors. We're name. we're an unscripted show here. This is great. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was gonna mess up his name. J. Robert Bradley. Thank you, ancestors. Thank you, ancestors. But yeah, so I try to sing in those sort of styles. And what you find is of that era of that golden age gospel era, there tended to be just because of how things were in the in culture in general, there was all of those great, quote unquote, gospel singers, many of them had some form of training. Mm, mm-hmm. So the public schools, these segregated public schools had very, very fine directors and voice teachers. The churches that they went to, their ministers of music, uh, music directors, could often be college and or conservatory graduates Mm, mm -hmm. who, because of various factors, sometimes by choice, sometimes just by the limitations and racism of the time, didn't have the opportunities to go off and have careers in the fields that they had, that they said they studied. In fact, I met a, a, a lady here in Nashville, who was a classmate of Coretta Scott King's at New England Conservatory. And she said, oh, when I, she said, oh, yes, I remember young Martin would come and pick up Coretta and, you know, we would all be in the dorms together. They talked, she talked, told me all of these stories, right? And then she said, oh, yeah, we had the same voice teacher. Oh, but we, shoot, I think I learned about a hundred roles when I was in school. But when I got out, there was nowhere to do them. So I went into church music. Uh, so these, these are the kind of people that you got in church. These right. are the kind of people that are your music teachers. Just top-notch musicians, educators, etc. So whether or not you went to conservatory and formally studied, you had training. Yeah. As well as the natural training that comes about within these churches, learning, you know, to sing parts and pick up on harmonies and and sort of supporting the voice by practice. And this is another thing that Dr. Jones and I talk about that she's coined, or we've all said it, but I've kind of attributed to her, the Academy of the Black Church. So when I start singing in these spaces, 
I'm going to hearken back to that era, usually. So I'll pick a song like, um, there's a song that the Robert Martin singers used to do, Only a Look. Or I'll sing the hymn, um, Lord Keep Me Day by Day. And I'll sing it in a, in a head tone. You know, and I use all of the portamenti that you would that you hear in Mahalia Jackson singing, right? And then you, I'm also going to belt, hmm. and I'm going to holler in some way because that's also the style. I'm also comfortable with singing the more contemporary gospel things um, that come to Donald Lawrence, Richard Smallwood, Kirk Franklin, John P. Key, um, Mary Mary, the Clark Sisters. You know, all of that I have no problem getting into, but I have to think about it in regards to what I'm being asked to do, what the occasion is. And that's when you will sort of make the best choices in that. Hmm. Yeah. Now, it sounds like what you're describing is, I'm just going to assume, is also part of your, um, or has become maybe over the years of the course of your life, part of your teaching philosophy as well, because it sounds like what you're describing is, I'm a singer, therefore, I should be able to sing all these things, or why am I calling myself a singer? <laughs> I mean, yeah. So that same man that I talked about at the beginning, William Krim, all of us who studied with him, whether, because he taught at, uh, he and, and I should also say that he, he uh, teaches uh, on faculty at Tennessee State, uh, where I am now on faculty. So it's always full circle. It's kind of beautiful. Um, so I get to stay, sit, teach with my teacher who made me a counterterror, who put me on this path. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for that. But the way that he taught us was very disciplined, but very versatile. Um, he's the one that puts, you know, my, my, I think the pieces that he gave me for my auditions and all the competitions I did. Um, Verdin do tu amor, uh, O Thou from Messiah, Burley's Deep River. He's the one that made me a countertenor, right? But then when we're doing shows at Salama, you know, of course, my first show at with well, going back at Fisk was the gospel at Colonus. So that's straight up gospel singing. Uh, then what else other shows we did? We did Smokey Joe's Cafe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm singing Victor Trent Cook's uh, track, which is kind of a, another full circle thing because I eventually went on for Victor or do go on for Victor at different times with the original Cook Dixon, the original Three Motenas Cook Dixon and Young. Um, so I'm singing Victor's track in that. I had gone off to college a year at Morgan singing full countertenor, come back for the summer. He's like, okay, you're doing Tony and West Side Story. That's a whole tenor. I am an, in my motor voice, I'm a tenor, but you're going to come sing tenor, right? So he never taught us about limitations. He taught right. us discipline. Yeah. So the whole thing was, if you learn and settle in this instrument in a path, and we're going to use the bel canto technique to do that, you can sing anything. That's, I'm so glad you said that, because that, that has been my philosophy um, and teaching philosophy for so long, which is, and it's hard for some people to understand this, but... Uh, it sounds like you and I are, are get, uh, kind of in the same boat here, which is that because I trained as a classical singer, that does not mean I am, quote unquote, a classical singer. It means I have that training. It is now a set of tools, tools that I own, <clears throat> and I can use those tools to do anything and everything, yes. uh, which is a, a very, and it's kind of interesting because I, when I was hinting at uh, a time when I had an argument earlier in my life about with somebody about <laughs> whether or not there's a different black anatomy for the for the voice. Uh, it was based around this idea, which was that I was making the argument that um, you know if you're a young singer and you don't have any other singing training already, that I advocate that young singers start with classical training because it gives them the tools to access all of these other styles. 
and uh, the the accusation essentially essentially was leveled at me that I, that was a racist thing to to think that that starting with classical training was well you're just starting with white people singing, and I'm like okay well tell that to Eric Owens to his face or you know whatever you know so it's the idea that well no because what you're doing is you're teaching a certain way of controlling the instrument developing the instrument and as long as you are then making sure the student understands that that, that they are not pigeonholed that they're that they are not stuck to that then the sky is the limit for them and it sounds like that's what your your experience has been yeah it's been that but if i ex- if i may expand on that yeah I actually see hmm, I actually see my role as a teacher as really building upon what they already have. Mm-hmm. But when you come into the space, and if you have been just straight up gospel, straight up R and B, jazz, et cetera, let's find where this bel canto can fit, as opposed to let's turn you over. Right. I'd rather like build on what you already have. So for instance, um, and even in the lectures I give on this um, aspect, and I just gave one like on Wednesday, uh, it's so funny. But I talk about sort of the, how to like a possibility, a possible way of using uh, uh, one's uh, accent. So I went to undergrad in Baltimore, right? Baltimore people don't say two, they say T. They say you, you you doing that, yeah, all of that. Well, I mean, that's not too far away from the little Y and the little U in French. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So instead of me telling this young child that, oh, that, that East Baltimore, that West Baltimore, that, you know, that, that thing you got, throw that away. I say, no, keep that because you're going to need that in a second. Yeah. The biggest thing that I want to shift for the student, the default that I want to set for them is how they're prepared, is their process. So the process, the engagement of the body, the space, the breath, you can use all of that no matter what style tone, et cetera, you're preparing to for peace, to, to present rather. Absolutely. But, it's about, but I want you, I want to set the, set the default for the preparation and, and, and to set that up for your mind and body. So yeah. now you can maneuver wisely in all of it. Yeah, no, I I, agree. I completely agree, and I think one difference in the, what the, kind of the point I was hammering home in, in in your experience teaching is I teach high school kids, so oftentimes I'm talking about fourteen year olds that don't they're not gospel singers, they're not R and B singers, they're they've never sung before, right? Like ever anything, not at church, not anywhere, and I'm just trying to get them to get their vocal folds to touch together for the first time, <laughs> and that's a different animal. Yeah, it is. That's it a is. Example, yeah. And and for me, that's why I default to the 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 bel canto kind of a thing because it's it it is it's to me is a good entryway into resonating for the yeah. really for the first time. Uh, but as I think again, as long as I don't uh, set them up all the way through their high school years, thinking well that this this now allows you to sing songs from Italy in the 1600s and that's it. Well, right. then that, that would be stupid, and I don't do that. But I, I think that the, uh, I think that's where some people have, have trouble, because I completely agree with you that if you've, got a, if you've got a college student who comes with a singing background, you don't want to tell that student that everything that they learned was incorrect, and therefore now you're going to really teach them how to sing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's what can we use from before, and here's some new tools that I'm going to give you, um, which is awesome. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, so what are some examples, and, and this maybe could even be kind of our, our final little topic, uh, since we've covered so many things already that are just so great, exactly what I was hoping to get out of your brain tonight. Um, but so in, in these um, in these teaching scenarios uh, where you might have students from different backgrounds or students from different musical traditions or, or whatever, uh, what are how do you think of your... Um, your job philosophically in terms of what you want your students to be able to do 
by the time they're done with you? Like, do you have kind of a rubric for them? Yeah, it's a little bit of a rubric. Um, I always tell my students, usually in their first lesson, especially for those who are going to be um, like the degree, uh, the degree uh, track students, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do have some non-majors too. But with the degree track students, my goal, I tell them, when you leave out of Tennessee State University and when you leave from my studio, you will be able to make an informed decision. And further than, and, and, and beyond that, whatever decision you make, I'm gonna be proud of you. Uh, I'm gonna sing opera, great. I'm gonna sing musical theater, awesome. I'm going to go and be a recording artist, singer, songwriter. I'm actually leaving school. I actually had a student, <laughs> this one young lady, she stayed in school longer than she really intended to because she was like, I can't let prof down. I can't let, I can't let you down. But she didn't, she didn't like school and it wasn't for her. And I understood. And it wasn't that she, she wasn't doing bad in school either. Hmm. She was consistently on the Dean's list, like a 3.57 GPA consistently. It was not hidden for her. She hated it. Hmm. And she felt like sometimes rigors of the st our standard music program just didn't allow her to have the space of growth that she wanted. So she stayed like a year longer, but then she left. But now she's about to release her own music. She was dope when she came in and she's dope when she left. That's, that's, that's awesome. You know, so I didn't, you know, it's all of that. So my whole thing is do whatever you need to do, let's in, make an informed decision about it. Let's try it all. And let's, I want to expose you to everything. And I want to show you how you're going to be equipped to do anything. So, for instance, if you're going to be that recording artist, well, I'm going to move to New York. I'm trying to do this recording artist thing. I'm going to do this. Cool. You know, you could probably sing in some opera courses or get a church job. Mm -hmm. So that way your your own you, that way that that way your your other outlet or your form of income is not just working as a barista. And that's, at the same time, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with coffee. Nothing wrong with coffee. <laughs> nothing wrong with being a waiter. Nothing wrong with the hustle that you got to do. But, you know, maybe your hustle can be expanded. Yeah. And maybe if you were in that room, in the opera chorus, at the church job, there's some people there who might support your music. Because they just like you. They'll come to your show. You know, you don't know. So... Let me show you how all of this can feed together. That's one aspect. I recently started teaching from sort of a, an indigenous and, and Africana lens where I actually, especially because I'm at, at an HBCU, I come from HBCUs and mo much of my work is focused around HBCUs and the students that would come to these kinds of spaces. I look at this Africana lens and I, what I basically say is, hey, I know what the books say, that the first opera was written here and that, you know, this is where music starts in antiquity in Greece. And that's, that's nice. <laughs> but before anything came into formation, um, you know, when we talk about you know, the first people on the planet and where they were, that is clearly on the continent of Africa. Yeah. And so firstly, you, you are the genesis of everything. And two, so, so because you're the genesis of everything, when you're singing German leader, there wouldn't be German without the foundations of language that come from you being the foundation. So you have every right to sing it. You have every right to sing this Italian. You have every right to do it all. Mm -hmm. And because I've been fortunate to travel to the continent of Africa, Ghana and South Africa, I observe how people sang in community in the 
sort of in the, in the townships, in the villages, how they used and projected their instrument. And I was like, well, that sounds, that sounds like, that looks like, just like how we do in community back home. And so much of this has, although there has been an interruption, so much of it has not been interrupted. So this idea of, of creating space, of squealo, of resonance, et cetera. I know church mothers who've never taken a voice lesson in their life, but that voice is pointed yep. and, and focused more than your fave at the Met. I've heard, yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. So you can't tell me that, oh, you, well, you know, I don't, well, that's not a style, that doesn't belong to me. No, you have every right to do it. They're right accessing, it. they're as, accessing something that is um, more than even human. It's physics. Yes. They're, they're, ac they're accessing something that belongs to all of us. <laughs> exactly. And so I try to teach them from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And once I kind of break it down for them that way, then they are disarmed and ready to try it all. Yeah. So just to yeah. You know, you, you, you would probably like, I'm not sure if you caught it, but I did an episode, uh, it, was my, it was episode 73 with uh, Teodros Kiros, who is a, um, an Ethiopian uh, professor of philosophy at Berkeley School of Music. Um, and he, he mentioned, because when you said the thing about uh, th things starting in Greece, and that's what the history book says, and you know, we, had, we had a nice conversation in that episode about uh, even the Greek philosophers that we grow up studying, uh, they many of them spent 25, 30 years in Ethiopia, uh, yes. learn, learning how to do how to do philosophy, literally, and, they, and yeah, literally, and they brought that back with them, and the, that's where the history book started, you know. Um, and so it, it's a pretty it's a pretty limiting way of looking at the world, and I, and I would argue, I'm glad you're doing that at HBCU, but I would argue that we should all all of us whites should be doing that too which is to not limit ourselves to starting and stopping of history because it's like, it's everywhere. It's, it, it's, it's everywhere. you know, so that I would, I recommend people going back to listen to that episode because it was, it, he's, Dr. Kiros is like a, I don't know how to describe him. He's like a giant of a, of an intellectual, but th this, uh, this is awesome. And, and I'm really glad you tied all of that together because that's ultimately uh, what it sounds like, even from the article that we started out talking at the beginning uh, you know, it is, is classical singing or is any type of singing or singing in church, is it just for one group of people or is it just for one sexuality? You know, all these types of things. And, and it's all about, to me, it's all about expanding our concept of who, who gets to be involved. And it sounds like the inclusive, it, like inclusivity, as you described it, is looking at your students and saying, uh, I'm going to give you these tools, and then I will, like you just said, like I will trust you to make an informed decision on what you do with them. Uh, to me, that's like what in, being an inclusive teacher is. I love that aspect of sort of seeing a student get it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, and to be very clear, if there's a student that says to me, I want to do this particular path, if they say to me, I want to do opera, okay, now I'm going to give you the advice for that. <laughs> I'm going to connect you and you got to go down this because this is how we're going to do it. We got to, we're going to maneuver in this sort of industry. But if you want to do something else, then we can do that. And at the same token, I think they're, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but they're, <laughs> they have a teacher who is very familiar with all the styles, actively singing them. And they're in a city that does everything. So although I may not be singing a lot of opera and concert work and, and new music, well, I do some, some, do some new music and early music in Nashville, but a lot of that kind of stuff in Nashville, and I sing it elsewhere, I'm, I'm in a studio session. I have, you know, I'm the vocal and performance coach for a girl group called the Shindellas. Um, I'm the vocal coach for, uh, Brittany Spencer, who is killing it in country music. Mm -hmm. You know, other notable gospel artists have come to me. So it doesn't like I'm giving, and I'm giving them the same setup. 
same kind of open up, create the space, engage the body. You're getting that too in your lesson on caught on me a bed. Yeah. Right. So, and, and then being able to engage some of those same students as well as other singers in my community in doing the work of preserving our sound and doing that through the W. Krim Singers, AKA Wakanda Chorale, as well as merging that with Early Music City, um, the progressive early music uh, ensemble that I'm a co-founder of. Like being able to create and, and again, shift the default in community with students, with friends, colleagues, et cetera, is the greatest joy. That's just awesome. That's so, that's so great. Well, Patrick, this has been incredible. This is a great conversation. I appreciate you spending an hour with me. Thank you. This has been fun. Yeah, it's been great. Any any uh, final thoughts that or think nuggets of wisdom that you want to leave us with before we go? Sure, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think you know. I just think I want us all to be open. Uh, the more open we are to. Uh, to various perspectives. Uh, the more we're op- open we are to various perspectives, the more we will see that we're more connected than mm-hmm. we thought. Absolutely. And uh, and that is what that's what singing, making music, and making art should do for us. And anytime it feels like it's making that barrier, it's not the true intent. Absolutely. On the, on the video version, I'm clapping like this. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know I got a lot out of it. I learned a lot. If you are able, please like, share, leave comments, leave ratings. Anything that you do to interact with the show is very helpful. And then of course you can join the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy or you can use Coralosophy at checkout and any of our awesome sponsors, Sight Reading Factory, Graphite, Ryan Main, MyMusicFolders.com. And then, of course, join the conversation. I always want to hear from people. You can email Coralosophy at gmail.com. You can jump on the Coralosophers Facebook group and be a part of the conversation that is growing across our profession. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.